All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 6, the Bible says, Your glorying is not good, know ye not, that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right, verse number eight is my key thought this morning. It says, therefore, let us keep the feast with, not with old leaven, neither with leaven, the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is my uh, 28th part of the Let Us Sermon series. Uh, I've been preaching 28 weeks this year on the subject of Let Us, and this morning's title is Let Us Have Sincerity and Truth. Let Us Have Sincerity and Truth and truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. It's such a joy and an honor and a privilege to be your preacher, to be able to preach the Word of God. And I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you'll please give me your power as I preach. I yield myself to you, Holy Spirit. Fill me with your power. I pray, dear Lord, for the mind of Christ, that you'd help me to say exactly what you once said. And I pray, dear Lord, also for all the people that are here, that they'd have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. And Father, please do something great among us. If there's anybody among us that needs to be saved and baptized, help them to make those important decisions. Bless those that are watching online, on the, on the internet, through live stream. And I just pray you help now. And we give you all the glory for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us have sincerity and truth. Listen to this statement very carefully by way of introduction. How you do what you do is important to God. Don't forget that. How you do what you do is important to God. Every parent here that has had children that you've tried to teach um, about life knows exactly what I'm talking about right now. Um, every child in my home that lives under my care, they, I'll provide for them a roof over their head, clothes on their body, food in their belly. I'll provide for them a, a place to live and all the necessary things that they uh, need to just live. But I always ask my children to be a participant in the family and to participate, like helping out with, with cleaning and, and chores and just doing other things. Every parent here knows that if you have a child and you say, go clean your room or take out the trash or do the dishes, and they do it, but they do it with a bad attitude. It almost just ruins everything. You look at their bad attitude, and it's like fingernails going down a chalkboard. <laughs> all that, whatever, you know, I mean, it's just like, you know, wow, you know, I asked you or told you to do something and you're giving me an attitude. It's just, it's just, it's frustrating to no end. So God, our heavenly father feels the same way. He says, when you do what you do for me, I want you to do it in the right way. And that's the, the, the basis of our, of our sermon this morning. It, God is, in this passage, is directly speaking about when we gather for church. Look, look down, if you would please, at verse number 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so the context here is when ye are gathered together uh, as a church. So what, what happened was he was talking to them about some sin in their church and, and ha having to, you know, deal with it properly. And he said, uh, when you gather together, you know, God wants your church to be this way. He was saying, uh, when you gather, don't be a worldly carnal church. Don't be a church that all kinds of sin is just happening in the, in the congregation and, and, you're, and you're mocking the Lord's Supper, you're using alcoholic beverage for the Lord's Supper, and you're doing all kinds of, all this, all this stuff that God doesn't approve. And so obviously gathering together and going to church is a good thing. But he said, while you're gathering together and, the, and when you do obey me and come to church, he says, how you come together is very important to me. And so God gives us a stark contrast in verse number eight. It says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with 
old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right, so he's, he contrasts malice and wickedness with sincerity and truth. So what he was saying is, he says, look, 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 look. Leaven represents sin. Your old sin nature, the things you did before you were saved, and the things that caused you to need to be saved. He said, when you gather together, he said, don't bring your old leaven in with you. Don't have malice and wickedness at church as you live for me. He says, when you come to church and when you live for me, God says, I would like you to do it in sincerity and in truth. Okay, so God was saying here, I don't want you to come to church and make this uh, and make your Christian life like you're not even saved at all. He goes, I want you to act like you are my child. I want you to do things a certain way. And so this stark contrast that God gives us, he says, let us have sincerity and truth. I'm going to give you a four-point outline. So if you'd like to take notes, um, this, is, uh, this is the thought from verse number eight. Number one, write this down. Not with malice. Not with malice. Malice. Now, malice is not a word that we often use. Are you listening this morning? Uh, malice is not a word that we often use, but let me give you the definition so in case you don't know what it is. It means this, extreme enmity of heart. That's what malice is. When you got such hatred in your heart for someone, the word enmity is like an enemy. So you are, in your heart, really intent on being someone's enemy, all right? So that's malice. It also means a disposition to injure others. And it doesn't matter what the reason is. Malice is, I'm going to hurt you. It could be, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. It could be, I just don't like you, so I'm going to hurt you. Uh, it could be, I'm jealous of you and all that you got and, and you know, and, and what you do. You know, I've, I've noticed that um, um, people in society, society, when someone has more than them, they have that, that, that evil bug of jealousy. And they think, oh, you must have gotten it in a corrupt way. I, I, I remember when I first uh, uh, experienced this, when I was in California as a teenager, oh, I think I may have been 13 or 14, uh, one of my, um, one of my um, uh, step relatives, I guess, I had, a, I had a stepfather and somebody on his side of the family had this really, really nice convertible car. And, um, and, and he came to see us, you know, and we were talking and, and I was looking at his car and I'm like, wow, man, that's a nice car. You know, it was a real fancy car for a teenager, you know, thinking, yeah, man, that's nice. You know, I don't know how much it cost him or anything like that. He goes, yeah, it's a nice car, but it, it brings a lot of, it brings trouble with it. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, oh, people are jealous. They see my nice car. And, and I've had people take like a big gulp from uh, 7-Eleven and just throw it inside my open window or just my, my convertibles down, you know, they just throw it in there and the soda just splashes all over my interior of my car and the reason that that happened is because somebody saw this car that they were jealous because someone owned it but they didn't own it and so they had that malice in their heart and they said I'm just going to throw something uh in there and and make him unhappy because he's jealous you know and I learned that as a teenager again I was like 13 or 14 just a young teenager and, and now as a 50 year old man I've been pastoring for 25 years I see that same thing in our culture right now if somebody's a millionaire oh they must be evil Wealthy people are evil, and people that have nice houses, man, they must be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, defrauding other people or stepping on people's backs, or, or they get jealous, and they have that malice in their heart, you know, and that's why so many people in our society uh, believe in socialism, and they want to take um, from the rich and uh, give to the poor, like socialism. You know, uh, someone who's poor, who doesn't, uh, maybe has, ha has enough money, uh, the rich people got it uh, in a wrong way. So we got to take it from them and, you know, uh, and make them give to the poor. So the poor will, you know, will have what they want and what they need, you know. And, and, and all that is is malice, folks. It's just malice. People saying, I want what you have, and I don't like the fact that you have it, and so I'm going to hurt you in order for me to get what you have or make you not enjoy what you have. And that's just wrong. I mean, I've heard of people that have nice cars, and they go shopping, come out, and their tires have been slit. Or someone comes by, and they key the side of their car because they're, they're jealous. They, they look at someone having something nice and think it's not right that they don't have something nice. Well, God says, in your heart, in this church, you should never have malice in your heart. You should never 
to have a disposition to injure others. Malice also means harboring ill will towards others. You know, harboring ill will. When something bad happens to someone, you're happy about it. You harbor ill will, hoping that they really get what's coming to them. You know, instead of, you know, looking at someone and loving them and wanting to forgive them. Malice is harboring ill will. So, God says to this church, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for the, uh, the Apostle Paul was writing it. He says, look, when you gather together, don't gather with malice. Don't have malice in your heart. Extreme enmity of heart. Disposition to injure others. Har harboring ill will towards others. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's not how I want you to live for me. Let let's look at two passages of Scripture as we um, think about this. Titus chapter 3. Turn over to Titus chapter number 3, please. Titus chapter 3. And we're going to start reading in verse number 3. Titus is um, uh, two books before Hebrews. And Titus is what we call a pastoral epistle. Paul the Apostle wrote three pastoral epistles, first and second Timothy. Timothy was a pastor, and then Titus was a pastor. And a lot of Paul's books, like to the Romans and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, all that, Ephesians, they were written to either a church or a group of people. And, um, and this was written just to a pastor. And so let's look at what Paul had to say in uh, Titus chapter 3, start reading in verse number 3. Now watch this. Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. All right, so in verse number three, he says this, for we ourselves, Paul was writing to Titus saying, look, this is how we used to be. We were sometimes, uh, ourselves, before we got saved, foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts, pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. He said, this is what happened to us. Then it says in verse 4, but... After that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, and we got saved. Everything's different. So listen to this carefully. Because, okay, before you were saved, all you could do to improve yourself was self-help. Think power of positive thinking. <laughs> I can do better. I, you know, I'll go to a meeting and, and uh, you know, tell everybody, hi, my name is so-and-so, I'm an alcoholic, and, uh, 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 and just go down the list, and then just, you know, you, you do your self-help stuff. You take steps. You have this, that, or the other. Well, God says, listen this carefully, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So God says this, you will never in your sinful nature ever reach my glory. You will never become like me in your own, in, in your own uh, flesh. You will never achieve a good life in and of yourself. You need something different. And, that, and that's why God sent his son Jesus to save us. Save us from hell and to give us a, a different life. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So that literally means whatever change needs to take place in your life, you, you can have that change, but it's only going to be through Christ Jesus. And that's why you need to get saved. Oh, my soul. Salvation, not only it keeps you from going to hell, it gives you a home in heaven. Salvation does so much more than just saving you from hell it gives you an opportunity at a changed life and Paul was writing to Titus and he said remember when we used to behave this way and then the kindness and the love of God shone upon us and we got saved it says in verse 5 not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he, sh he saved us verse 6 which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior then it says in verse 7 being justified by grace we should be made heirs Here's what he was saying. Now that we're saved and his mercy and his grace has come upon us, now we can act like we're heirs of Jesus Christ, heirs of God. We can live like we are supposed to live. Why? Because salvation made it possible. Salvation made it possible. So here's what God says. Now that you are saved, 
Don't live in the former foolish lusts that you lived in before you were saved. Don't have malice. You did that before you knew better. You did that before you got saved. You did that before, um, you know, uh, the, the kindness and the love of God shone upon you. You did all of that back then. He says, no, no, now that you're saved, live like you're saved. Act like a child of God. Live right. Don't live for God with malice. Let me give you one more passage to look at. Turn over, please, uh, to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter. Chapter number two, please, and look down at verse number one. Y'all glad to be here this morning? All right, all right, glad you're here. First Peter, chapter number two, and we're going to read verses one, two, and three. First Peter, chapter two, and verses one, two, and three. All right, first Peter, chapter two. And verses 1, 2, and 3. Look what it says now. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. All right? So here, uh, uh, Peter now is writing this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, lay aside all malice. Take all of that malice that's in your heart, that's um, extreme enmity of heart, disposition to injure others, harboring ill will towards others. God says you take all that malice and you lay it aside. And God tells us how to do that. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now watch this carefully. Now that you're saved, do you know how you're going to grow as a Christian? By the word of God. By the word of God. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. There are two primary ways that the word of God helps you to grow. Number one, through preaching and teaching. That's when you come to church, you hear the word of God being taught, and you hear it being preached, and it helps your faith to grow in the Lord. Number two, by Bible reading. By, by being fed. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. All right. So, if you eat food, how many of you? How many of you eat every day? Would you raise your hand? How many of you love to eat? I love to eat. My, my soul. How many of you think you eat too much every day? I'm, I'm my hands up. I eat too much every day. But it just like you need physical food just to live, you need spiritual food, and the source of spiritual food is the Word of God, not Walmart. I'm sorry, you can't. You can go to Walmart and get most everything you need, but not the word, not not the word of God. Spiritual food, all right. So, uh, spiritual food comes from the Word of God. So, what you do is you read it every day, and then listen carefully. You come to church as much as you can. Now, one hour a week. You understand? Listen. Going to one church service a week is just the beginning. It's just the entry level. It's just getting started. We've got five different church services every week that you can attend. All five of them are different. We also have prayer meeting. We also have soul winning times. On occasion, we'll have special meetings like a missions conference, etc. So the more you come, the more you get fed the Word of God, the more opportunity you have to grow in Christ. So preacher, what does it take for me to get malice out of my out of my heart and out of my life? It takes you getting saved and then after you get saved, it's you growing in the in the in the Lord through the word of God. The more you read your Bible, the more you listen to Bible preaching and teaching, the more you're going to grow and the more malice is going to get out. And so, listen this very carefully. Don't forget this statement. This book will keep you from sin. Or sin will keep you from this book. See, if you're living in sin, you don't want to read the Bible very much. You don't want to come to church. You, just, you know, whatever. Sin does that to you. But if you want to give up sin and you want to live right, well, then you read the Bible every day, and, and sin starts to get less and less and less dominant in your life. No, you're not going to attain perfection, but the fact is you can improve. You can grow in the Lord, and sin can have, have less and less of an impact or a chain around you as you get older in the Lord because of the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful. Oh, is it powerful. All right, so... God says, uh, point number one, not with malice. So Paul said to the church, uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, let us not gather with malice, um, instead with other things. Number two, write this down, not with wickedness. Not with wickedness. All right, so in our text passage, 
uh, Paul said, um, uh, therefore, let us keep the feast. Uh, and that feast is talking about when you get, get together for church and you have a feast. You have a, uh, the, the word of God being preached or maybe a big day, a special occasion or whatever. But church is supposed to be a feast. And he says this. Um, it, it says, uh, uh, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. So he said, when you gather together, don't come together with malice in your heart. And number two, don't come together with wickedness. All right. What is wickedness? Here's the definition of wickedness. Ready? Departure from rules of divine law. Departure from rules of divine law. It also means immorality and sinful living. All right? Wickedness is a departure from the rules of divine law. That means you ain't going to tell me what to do, God. That's a departure from the rules. I don't have to follow rules. You don't have to tell. I'm going to do what I want. That is wickedness according to the bible god says you're not supposed to have an attitude of departing from rules especially god's rules the divine law all right so god is saying to us here don't come to church lawless don't come to church and say i don't have to do what you tell me preacher or i don't have to do what the bible says i don't i can do what i want i'm my own man my own lady i'm my i'm an adult i can do what i want to do all right that's wicked in the eyes of god that's wicked and then it's immorality and sinful living okay so here's the difference between sinning and wickedness all right sinful living okay let's suppose you sin all right let's suppose say cuss word let's just use that for an example Dirty bricker, bracker, slapper, rib. One of those is a cuss word. All right. So you said, <laughs> that's all in the Greek. I just, you know, cuss in Greek. And you don't even know it. And you think I'm, I'm being spiritual. But anyway, no. Uh, <laughs> just tease it. So here we go. You say a cuss word, right? Oh, I sinned. Oh, God, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not wicked if you sin, all right? Because you, you ask God to forgive you, you try to go on. But let's suppose you just say, you know what? I'm a cusser. I'm going to cuss as much as I want. I'm going to do it as often as I want. And nobody, you know, I'm, nobody's going to tell me not to cuss. And you're just going to live a life as a cusser. That's called sinful living. God says that's wicked. That's wicked. In our society, there's this great national sin all over america is called internet pornography it is a sin in god's eyes well let's suppose you looked at something that was sinful internet pornography whatever the case may be and you looked at it and you're like oh i'm so sorry god please forgive me i shouldn't have looked at that i let the temptation get to me and you turn it off and you and you don't look at it again right well that's not wicked you sinned you asked god to forgive you you went on but let's suppose you say, you know what? I enjoy internet, internet pornography. I'm going to look at it every chance I can. I'm watching it, and nobody's going to tell me I can't. And I'm not doing anything bad, by the way. I'm, I'm not harming anybody. It's just for me, my thoughts, and my pleasures. And, and, and you just live your life, every day of your life, engaged in internet pornography. That's wicked. That's wicked. It needs to be said loud and clear in America. That's wicked. This is a national sin. And it's like, I don't know, 70%, I think I've been told, of the people in our, in our society, uh, as far as young people, young adults and teenagers, are engaged, heavily engaged in internet pornography. Uh, 80% occasionally uh, um, uh, partake in internet pornography, and like 90% have, uh, have been exposed to it. I mean, it's everywhere. Teenagers and young adults, it's everywhere. Now, older adults, I, I don't know if I've ever heard a, a statistic on that, older adults, but it is a rampant sin in our society. Now, we've got to address it. It doesn't bring us closer to God, folks. It pushes us farther away. So let's suppose you commit a sin. God says, if you confess it, I'll forgive you. If you forsake it, you'll, you'll, you'll prosper. But let's suppose you say, I'm not interested in confessing it. I'm not interested in forsaking it. I am going to live in this sin. And then that's the definition of wickedness. So what God tells us here is this. When you gather together, when you live for me, don't live for me with wickedness. 
No, church is for sinners. You come to church and you want to get help. This is the place to come. But if you come to church and you say, I'm not interested in getting help. I want to have one foot in God and one foot in the world at the same time. I want to go to church on Sunday morning and live like the devil Monday through Saturday. And I just want to come to church to appease my conscience and to make God maybe let me go to heaven or whatever the idea might be. That's wicked. That's wrong. And God says, I don't want you to come under those terms. I don't want you to live for me with malice in your heart heart and with wickedness in your life I want you to live for me in a way that I want you to live he says I've got a book to tell you how I want you to live and that's how I want you to 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 uh, go to church that's how I want you to um, participate in ministry that's how I want you to pray and read my Bible and uh, live for me I want you to do it the right way so the first thing is not with malice Number two, not with wickedness hey look at look let's look at two references real quick before we get to point number three Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter number 8. And look down at verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse number 8. The Bible says this. Ecclesiastes is right after the book of Proverbs, but it, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 8 and verse 8. By the way, if you have a hard time finding a book in the Bible, there usually is a table of contents in the front of the Bible, and you can see what page number the book is on. Chapter 8, verse 8. Here we go. There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Look what it says now. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. You know what God says? On the day that you stand before me, your wickedness is not going to deliver you. He says, if you give yourself to wickedness, he goes, when you stand before me, it's not going to be like God's going to look at you and say, why'd you do that? You're like, because I wanted to. Oh, okay. All right, well. Listen, go on your way. No, God says wickedness ain't going to deliver you. Righteousness will deliver you, <laughs> but wickedness won't. There is going to be a day of reckoning, folks. Now listen, you've got to think about that. There is going to be a day that we stand before God, and there is going to be a day of reckoning. We don't want to stand before God by giving ourselves to wickedness because it won't deliver us. Let's look at another verse. Look at Mark. Mark chapter number 7. Turn over uh, Matthew and then Mark in the New Testament. Mark chapter number 7. Mark chapter 7. Look at verse 20. Mark chapter 7 and verse 20. All right? Mark chapter 7 and verse 20. Look what it says. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. All right, so here's what God says. If you are living in a wicked lifestyle, it's because you have a wicked heart. And what you need is heart surgery. Listen, too many of us, have you ever heard the expression in the world, follow your heart? That is so bad. You should never follow your heart. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things who can know it. Your heart's not going to, come on, man. Your heart's not going to lead you in the right way. The Bible says you should guide your heart in the way. A wise man will guide his heart. So here's what this means. Don't just allow your heart to tell you what it loves. <laughs> you tell your heart what to love. That's what you do. Okay. The Jews were trying to trap Jesus in a question, which is insane, but they were trying to. They came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, what's the most important law in the whole Old Testament? Jesus responded, I'll tell you what the most important law is. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then he said, number two, the second greatest law, commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, the entire law 
in the whole Bible is hung on those two commandments. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you'll do those two things, everything else in the Bible you'll do. Now, what does that mean? Here's what this means. Get your heart right with God and your life will follow. Get your heart right with God and your life will follow. So you know what that means? Stop loving wickedness. And why don't you start loving God? Oh, God, I love you with all of my heart. Woo! And then start loving people. And guess what will leave your heart? Wickedness. And once wickedness leaves your heart, wicked behavior will no longer be a part of your life. You see, the greatest need of our society today is a heart transplant. We need to start loving God, and we need to start loving each other. That's what we need. If we had started, oh, I heard today, I heard today. I was so saddened. This morning down in Texas, there was another shooting, and somebody killed seven people before the police finally got to him and, and took him down and killed him. But this had nothing to do with the store. Evidently, it was a traffic stop, and a guy got pulled over and started shooting at the police and then drove off and started shooting at other people and stole a car, started driving down and started shooting, going crazy. And here's all the politicians. We need more gun laws. We need more gun laws. We need more gun laws. No, that's not what we need. No, I'm, I'm, ser I'm deadly serious. We don't need more gun laws to take away guns. What we need is heart surgery. We need to start loving God and then start loving each other. And only God can do that. Only God can do that. Oh, man, don't, don't listen to these crazy politicians. Let's add one more law on the books, and they'll not ever murder again. <laughs> do you realize right now, do you realize right now there are over 40 laws that say you can't murder people? There's over 40 of them in the books. So let's add one more law, and it's going to, you know, and someone's going to say, oh, here's a stricter gun law. I guess I better not go commit murder today. That ain't happening, folks. What happens is the heart needs to change. The heart needs to change. We have got to somehow, in our culture, wake up and smell the coffee that the only thing that's going to make America better as far as a culture and a society is starting to love God and starting to love each other. As long as we say to God, I don't want you in our country, and as long as we look at each other and say, you have a different political position than I have or a different view than I have about life, so I hate you. As long as we hate God and hate people, it's just going to continue. Socialism and communism is not the answer. It's not going to make anything in this country better. We've got to have heart surgery. So listen, that's what you need in your life. If you've got wickedness in your life, you know what you need? You need heart surgery. Stop loving wickedness or sin or evil or malice. Stop loving that stuff and start loving God with all of your heart and then start genuinely loving people and then everything else will start to get better. All right, number three, write this down. With sincerity. With sincerity. All right, so the Bible says let us not come together with malice and wickedness, but with sincerity. All right, number three, with sincerity. What does the word sincerity mean? Here's what the word sincerity means. It means this, honesty of mind and intentions. That's sincerity. Honesty of mind and intentions. Next, it means not with hypocrisy, not being a hypocrite. Sincerity, finally, it means this, no false pretense. No false pretense, all right? So if you're going to be a sincere person, that means you need to have honesty of mind and intentions. You intend well. It means you're not a hypocrite. You don't say one thing and do another. That's not sincere. And then you have no false pretense. In other words, okay, why do you tithe? Why do you tithe? Do you tithe so that you can get rich, so you can have the windows of heaven open up so you become a millionaire? Is that why you tithe? That's not sincere. You ought to tithe because you say, God told me to, and I love him. And I just want to be a part of I want to. I want to invest in his kingdom. If I become a millionaire or not, it doesn't matter. I'm, just, I'm, I'm doing it because I love God. That's, that's what sincerity is. Sincerity is having the right intentions and the right motives. 
Insincere, if you're not sincere, it means you have a false pretense. It means you're a hypocrite. Oh, my. As I delve into the world of politics, you know, I'm running for office and everything. I find, I find these people, you know, we, often in, in, in our culture, we, we have had the view that politics is corrupt as a whole. Government is corrupt. And now I'm seeing it firsthand. It is. There's a whole bunch of people in politics that do not have the best interests of the people they represent. They have ulterior motives. They're not sincere. They're in it for a career. Maybe they're in it to make money. They're in it to, 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 do, uh, to uh, make their personal lives better. We, we hear about it all the time. There was this one politician down in the Denver area who ran on being a moderate. He goes, if, I, if you elect me, I'll be, on, I'll, I'll be a fan of both sides, conservatives and liberals. I'll, I'll stand with both. And then, of course, he got elected into office. And then the whole 2019 session, he was all on one side. Didn't even, not even have one vote on the other side. He, he just lied. Vote me in and I'll, I'll do this. And then he gets in and does something different. You know what that meant? He wasn't sincere. He's a hypocrite. Someone who had a false pretense. We've heard that for years and years and years and years and years. Politicians run on a campaign promise and then they get elected and they don't keep it. Well, God says, I don't want you to be that way. I want you to be sincere. That's how I want you to serve me. With an honest mind and honest intentions, not with hypocrisy and with no false pretense. Let's look at two verses as we think about this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Turn over to 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians, chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians, chapter number 2. And look at verse 17. Y'all glad to be here this morning? It's good stuff. This is really good stuff. You need to be a sincere person. You really do. God will bless you if you are. All right? 2 Corinthians, chapter 2. Look at verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and he said there are preachers out there who corrupt the word of God, but we're not that, we're not that way. We're sincere when we preach. I've often said this for 25 years. I've been your pastor. I have made mistakes. There have been decisions that I've made that did not turn out like I thought they would. There are sometimes I preach a message and I go back home and I meditate on the message I preached and I think to myself, I should have said that differently. And the next time I preach on that topic, I will. Um, sure, there's been plenty of times, but, but I'm going to tell you this. For 25 years, you could not find a pastor that is more sincere than me. I sincerely want to please God and I want to help you. Case in point is I'm not afraid of preaching anything. I'll preach on any subject God wants me to preach on. And people get mad at me. They won't come back. And I'm sorry, I'm sad that they get mad at the preaching of the Word of God, but I'm not going to compromise the Word of God just to get you to come back. That's, that's, that's not sincere. As a man of God, I'm supposed to represent the Lord, and I'm supposed to preach God's Word as God wrote it and give it to you straightforward and truthful and honest. That's what I'm supposed to do. There are some preachers, though, you know, they, they take the Word of God and they maybe browbeat people with it, or they take the Word of God and, and they try to manipulate people, manipulate them. You know, there's a lot of tele-evangelists and uh, people that are famous on the radio and TV. They've got, you know, $10 million homes. They've got seven or eight or nine or ten jet airplanes. They've got, you know, luxury cars. and I mean, all that stuff, right? What in the world? No, I mean, like, what in the world? It's one thing to have a dependable vehicle that will get you from point A to point B. It's another thing, to, you know, uh, one thing to have a nice house to live in that, you know, you could actually enjoy your house and then you know, entertain guests, like the Bible says, you know, things like that. It's one thing to have, you know, money, but, but, but why have, you know, tens of millions of dollars just stocked up in a bank somewhere? What's the purpose of that? You see, there's a lot of preachers in our culture 
that they are corrupting the Word of God, meaning they preach the Bible with self-interest at hand. They, they want to benefit themselves. When I stand up here and I tell you to tithe, there's not one, of the, not, not one penny of that tithe money that you put in the plates comes to me, and I do with it what I want. It ain't happening. Not here. What we do is we vote on it. We have a budget, a church budget. Um, we, the deacon board and myself, we talk and we figure out what the best uh, approach is financially for the upcoming year. And we have um, um, a, a vote and then we present it to the people and then the people vote on it, yes or no. And that budget is, is our boss. We are not allowed to spend outside of that budget. Why? Because it's not my money. It's, 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 first of all, it's God's money. But, but secondly, it's all of ours. We, 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 you know, I, I don't have a right to say I'm going to do what I want and buy, and buy what I want and, and spend things what I want. That's, that's insincere. If I preach the Word of God and say, bless God, you have to do what I say, and when I tell you to do what I say, it just simply benefits me, that's corrupt. And that's what Paul said. We're not that way. We don't preach that way. He said some people do, but not us. We are sincere in the sight of God and in and speaking on God's behalf. All right, so when God says you come to church, be sincere about what you preach, about what you teach. Next, look at Philippians chapter 1. We got one more point and we'll be done. Philippians chapter 1, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philippians chapter 1. And look down, if you would, please, at verse number 20. Philippians. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 10. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 10. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says this, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. All right, you know what God says? Why don't you stop, just, why don't you stop getting by in life and why don't you shoot for the excellent life? Approve what is excellent. Don't just be an average Christian. Don't just be an average church. Don't just get by and do the bare minimum. Why don't you shoot for excellence? And one of the ways he said that you could do that is to be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. So God says, listen, you know what the excellent life is? To be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Don't offend people. Don't offend God, at least not on purpose. You know, sometimes you offend people because you just can't help it because people are offended. We live in a society that, man, if you just wake up and get out of bed, you offended somebody. You know, we had this one multi-billionaire die recently, and, and some talk show person or nighttime guy said, I'm glad he's dead. That's what he said, national guy, because he was wealthy. And, and he supported a politician that he didn't like. So because he's wealthy and he gave money to a politician he didn't like, and he, he died, oh, good, the world's a better world because he's dead. There are some people in this world that you just being alive is going to offend them, and there's nothing you can do about it. You just can't stop that. But here's what you can do. You can live your life sincerely and try not to offend people. I mean, give it your best effort. <laughs> you know, I, I, learned, I learned in uh, Bible college that if people get offended at my position in Christ, I can't help that. But if they get offended at my disposition, then I can help that. So my position in Christ is from the Word of God. And if it offends people, there's nothing I'm going to do to change it. But how my disposition is, how I treat people, I can change that. And I can do my best to just be as loving as I possibly can be, gracious and forgiving and compassionate as I can possibly be. And then if they're still offended, then I just wash my hands of it. But God says, you want to live that excellent life? Be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. All right, number four and last. God says, let us have sincerity and truth in that verse. He said, let us not have malice or wickedness, but let us have sincerity. And number four and last, write down these two words, with truth. With truth. Let us have truth. What does the word truth mean? It means this, conformity to fact or reality. It means veracity. It means purity from falsehood. All right, what is the truth? Conform conformity to fact. Truth is not an opinion, by the way. Are you listening? Just because you have an opinion doesn't mean it's true. Just because you have a perception of something doesn't mean it's true. Have you ever looked at a video or a painting or a picture and it looked like something and then afterwards you found out, well, it wasn't that at all. 
I saw this one video on, uh, I don't know, Facebook or something, and it had this dog with five legs. I was like, wow, man. Look at this dog with five legs. And then all of a sudden, the other dog came out from underneath of him, and <laughs> it wasn't his fifth leg after all. <laughs> But when you just first looked at that video and you just saw that dog standing there, one, two, three, four, five legs, you didn't see the other dog. It was like a, an optical illusion of some kind. Well, look, just your perception of things does not mean it's truth. Sometimes people perceive things that are just really not there. You, you ever done that with a text? Someone sent you a text and you thought they were all mad at you while they're texting you. And they, they weren't mad at you at all. But you took it the wrong way. Sometimes text messages are hard to understand what's, what's being said. You know, because you see the words, but in your mind you're trying to think, how, how's this word being spoken? And human nature is to think the worst. Human nature, our sin nature, is you don't give people the benefit of the doubt. So your perception of something is, could be totally wrong. It's an old story, but can I tell you just real quick? There was a teenage girl that was in our church about you know, 20 years ago, whatever, but she was sitting on the back row, and she was messing around, misbehaving while I was preaching, like some of you are right now. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but she was messing around. And so instead of just calling her name out, I just like, I'd be preaching like this, and then I'd try to get her attention, you know, like my eye make contact with her eye. And, um, and, and, and so I did, and I think, I can't remember, I think she showed me which way was up or something like that. And I mean, she, got, she was just really obnoxious. And, um, and then I was preaching, and I'm like looking at her like, come on now, you know, I, with my eyes. I was saying, you know, start behaving right, you know. Well, the lady in front of her thought I was looking at her the whole time. <laughs> she stopped coming to church. About two or three weeks went by, and she hadn't come, and, so I went and paid her a visit, and I said, hey, so-and-so. I said, uh, I've been missing you. You doing all right? She goes, I'm not coming back. I said, whoa, because this is the lady got saved and baptized in our church. I said, what in the world? What happened? She goes, last time I came to church, you were throwing looks at me, and I don't think you ought to do that to someone who comes to church. I said, excuse me? I was throwing looks at you? That's the way she worded it, but, you know, I, you know looking mean at her. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, three Sunday mornings, you know, I was sitting towards the back, and just throughout your sermon, you just stop and look at me, and like, mm, like that. And you made me feel bad. I ain't coming back. I, I said, oh. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, you misunderstood. And I explained to her, the teenage girl sitting in the row behind her was misbehaving and, and you know, being real disrespectful, you know, being vulgar. And so I was just trying to get her attention that I saw so she knew I saw what she was doing, tried to get her to stop. I said, I had nothing to do with you. You know what she said to me? She goes, oh, like that. And then she goes, well, I'm still not coming back. Then shut the door. What in the world? You misunderstood something that I did, and you got mad at me, and when I explained it to you, and you realized that what you thought happened really wasn't what happened, and you're still going to be mad? How dumb is that? That person probably never has stayed together with a husband. Never, had been married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced, married. Probably went from job to job to job to job to job because all she, if she lives that way and perceives things to be so and then finds out that they're not but says, no, I still feel the same way, that ain't much of a life. But here's the thing. Listen, truth is based on fact, reality. Veracity, purity from falsehood. God says, when you live for me and come to church, do it with truth. Don't do it with misconceptions. Don't do it with perception or opinion. God says, I don't care about your opinion. I care about truth. Let's look at a couple of verses and then we'll be done. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And look at verse number 1. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 1. 1 John chapter 2, and look down at verse number 1, please. My little children, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin, 
We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. So here's what God says. You think you have a relationship with me? He says, you really think you know me? God's speaking now. You really think you know me? And you don't keep my commandments? He said, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. He says, if you do know me, You'll keep my commandments. You see, if you ever, it's not talking about being saved, by the way. It's talking about a relationship with God. If you ever get to the point where you have a close relationship with God, I promise you, you will have no problem keeping God's commandments whatsoever. You'll be like, God, I'm happy to do what you want. Tell me what to do. Tell me what not to do. I'm happy to listen. I just love you. You're so awesome. You're a great God. But all these people in our society that say, I have such a great relationship with God, and they never do what God says to do, they're liars. They do not know God. Because that's, that's exactly what it says. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You know what God says? When you live for me, make sure the truth is in you. Make sure the truth is in you. Live for me. Obey what I say. Do what I say. That's how I know that you really have a close relationship with me. Let's look at one more verse along this line. Look over at 1 John. I'm sorry, 3 John. Just two, two uh, books over to the right. 3 John, verse 4. There's only one chapter. Only 14 verses in the whole book. 3 John, verse 4. We're almost done, so you can get excited again. <laughs> third john verse four look what it says third john verse four i have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth you know what god says you want to really put a smile on my face walk in truth walk in truth i have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth you know i have i have five sons I now have four, as of tomorrow, that are going to be adults. Four. I have one that's a 14-year-old still, you know. But four that are adults. You know what? As a father, when I hear that my adult children are living right, it puts joy in my heart. When I hear that my adult children are not living right, it causes me to be discouraged in my heart. It causes me to have pain in my heart. And God, our Heavenly Father, is the same way. When he looks down from heaven and sees you, his child, because he saved you, and you're living right, woohoo! I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And then the flip side is, when you're living like the devil, living like the unsaved world, and God's up in heaven. It's like, I wish you wouldn't do that. Man, you're breaking my heart. I don't know how you feel about God, but I don't want to break God's heart. I want God to have happiness in his heart because of me, because of what I do. I love it when, you know, God looks down from heaven and says, who went to church today? And he, on a Sunday, he looks down and he sees you at church. He's like, I'm so glad you went to church. And then there are Sundays when he looks down from heaven and says, where are you at? You're not there. I wish you'd come. I wish church was important to you. God says, when you live for me, do it according to truth. Do it according to truth. It'll make God happy. One last verse. One last verse, and we're all done. Go to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. This is it. We'll be done in about two minutes. John, chapter 14, and verse 6. John 14. And verse number 6, please. John 14 and verse number 6. Are you there? 
A very famous verse, John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Do you know what truth is? If you want to go to heaven when you die, you got to go through Jesus Christ. Your baptism will not get you to heaven. Your good life will not get you to heaven. Your religion will not get you to heaven. Whatever ideas that people may have as far as getting to heaven will not get them to heaven. Jesus says, I am the truth and the way. And then he says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So here's the thing. If you want to go to heaven, the true way to go to heaven is Jesus Christ. You need to receive him as your personal savior. You need to ask him to save you. If you've never done it, you need to do it. If you want to go to heaven, he's the truth. He's the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. And I'm so grateful, Father, for all that you do for us. Thank you, dear Lord, for being so generous and so kind. And Lord, I just pray now, I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you'll speak to hearts, minister to every person who's here. Holy Spirit of God, please do something real among us. Help us to be determined to live our lives with sincerity and truth and not in malice and wickedness. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Please, nobody looking around. It's time for you to.